This is Dave Meltzer with Entrepreneurs the Playbook, and I have a social media genius, Human Nuri. He uh, has Human TV, as everybody knows, millions and millions of subscribers. But most people don't know, you know, that we all don't start as social heroes, and we all have challenges, shortages, voids, and obstacles that have occurred. I love your entrepreneurial journey because a lot of people talk about sacrifice and I hate that word. When I read about you and did my due diligence, I'm like, here's a guy that understood investing in himself. Even when other people were, you know, counterintuitively telling you what to do, you kind of just invested in yourself and taking it all the way back, you went to college and that wasn't really for you. Mm -mm. <laughs> Tell Lots me about of... going to college. Going to college, man. Um, so. I mean, long story short, after high school, so when I, when I finished high school is when I had just figured out high school. <laughs> so I'm seeing all my friends, you know, you know, have scholarships and if they're not going to school to, to college, they have really good jobs. So they worked in high school and now they're managers. I have friends that are getting married and all these, doing, doing all these big things. So I'm out here not having a clue as to what I got to do. And, you know, my parents and everyone around me is like, if you don't know what you're doing, just go to school and just, just. Just you know, sure. go through your what is it called GEDs? Or, no, okay, yeah. GED. What, is, what is the general units called? Yeah, G GED. GED. Yeah. So I'm like, all right, cool. So I go to college, and I I barely finished high school. So I actually went to high school in Irvine, this city right here. I went to Uni High, really nice school, and I got expelled. <laughs> I ended up going to Creekside, which is like base. It's attached to a police station. Nice. And it's gated completely. Man. Wow. Yeah. Got and then out. then you had to enroll into the like police supervised yeah. high school that. Mm -hmm. Waited yeah. a week and then I went to Creekside, which honestly was the best uh, experience ever in my life because it's it's where I genuinely learned things. And, you know, high school in, in my nice fancy school, you know, we're all spoiled with nice classes and yeah. nice IMAX and stuff, and we're just reading off books. I, I to this day, if you ask me what I learned in high school, I can't I can't give you an answer. Nothing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my other school, the the one that I went to, the Creekside. I, I learned so many things about drugs, you know, like <laughs> not messing around with not, not messing around with bad people. I literally had classmates that I would talk to every day that would just not show up in school because they were dead. They were dead. Wow. Yeah, like we would just hear, oh, where's whatever her name? Oh, she she OD'd on bars. What? She was here yesterday. Yeah, you know, and she would gen this girl would generally come to the school every day. Hi, she would be on bars. We had other kids, you know, bringing guns to school or like doing stupid things. So as a, as a, as a uh, 16, 17 year old, I would watch these people do these things and I would see the outcome. Yeah. I would see the outcome of taking a bar to try it out, eventually getting hooked, eventually freaking passing away. I would see the outcome of ha hanging out with a bad crowd, getting sucked into the gang life and, and, and bringing guns killed. to school, getting arrested, going to juvie. Yeah. Um, so the amount of experience I learned from, and took away from that school was unbelievable. And then you go to college, school's not for you. Try Hell to get no. your GED. You yeah. were there a couple weeks, right? Yeah, I tried college, um, I would, I think, four different times. The first the first <laughs> two times I lasted a week, went to uh, two uh, community colleges in Irvine. Yeah. Uh, I, I, and I'm already dirt poor in college, and I'm just not getting the point of paying 300 bucks per book to sit in a class to, to learn about math when I'm trying to be when I'm trying to get a business degree. Yeah. Like, as a businessman, you don't do math and taxes. You hire the right person. Right? You don't care about science. You hire the right person. For yeah, it. and I think it even goes further today that not only can you hire someone, but there's technologies and applications and softwares and services that are out there beyond hiring someone. You know, it's like language for me. I keep on telling my kids, unless you want to practice that part of your brain that learns language, you know, there's no doubt in my mind within the next two years, there's an app on my iPhone that has 90 languages of translation that I hit. I call China and it yeah. translates in my voice into Mandarin and then back again. There already is right now. Exactly. I've seen it, I've seen it too. And I, it's just not on the iPhone yeah. yet. That's that ubiquitous, but it will be. Now, when, you, you know, young people tell me all the time, right? Well, I'm a businessman. I want to be a businessman. School's not for me. And I... I am very sympathetic, empathetic, and uh, actualizing to that. Like I feel that education is an experience, and if you can afford it, you should have that experience. And if you can't, then you should do and move forward with what you want. What was your perception of being a businessman, right? Like here you are kind of out of juvie or whatever the heck Creekside is, yeah. and you're failing out of school, it's not for you, but in your mind, you're a businessman. What was that vision? I, I think 
the the worst feeling to have as as a 14 15 year old is knowing you have what it takes and knowing how bad you want success but not having the roadmap that's where i was oh, i was willing to i hated to, that man you look it around and you're like i know i got it like, yeah. i've always had that same feeling like when i was in college and law school like all these other i'm like Dude, I knew, and I had no idea because I had, you know, my mom was a teacher with six kids and it, nobody was entrepreneurial around me. I went to this college right by where you live now that was a small liberal arts school. And I, I know that exact feeling of like, oh my God, I know I'm destined for something huge, but I have no idea how to get there. Exactly. So that's what I had. Uh, and by having what it takes, I don't mean talent. I don't mean any of that. I just mean, I just meant I was very, very hungry. Yeah. And my, one skill that I had that was really good was to, to the ability to mimic, uh, mimic people. And just if, if I met someone who knew everything about uh, a camera operating and I wanted to be a YouTuber, I would just vacuum every ounce of knowledge from that person's brain and just learn what I had to learn. But, uh, you know, growing up, I didn't really have like a, a strong father figure. I wasn't surrounded by... The, the quote unquote right people to get me to the right path. Uh, I just knew that I did not want to live life living in a four, a two bedroom with four people in a low income housing and not be able to pay for movies when I want to watch a movie. So I always knew that. My, the, my problem was though, uh, I didn't know how to get to this supposed successful place in life. That's why, you know, that's why I went to college. I was like, all right, well, if, if this is the supposed right, right, right path, I'm going to try it. And when I tried it and I, and I realized I don't enjoy this, I was like, is this really going to be it? Am I, am I, am I going to have to force myself to go through this route to somehow become successful? Even though I'm not studying, I'm not doing good. I just, it just yeah. didn't make any sense. So in my mind, I was always looking, my eyes were open, uh, looking for this right path to appear. So if, since I didn't know what to do, I just started to get a bunch of different jobs. So college wasn't going to be it. So either I'm going to be a loser and do nothing for the rest of my life, or but I'm going to. You were find... never lazy. Hell no. Yeah, yeah. Hell no. That's important because a lot of people think that laziness is equated to what you're talking about. In no respects, I see tons of people like you that want to effectuate something. They're such. They're like a mule. Like you're a not quit guy. You know, no quit, work as no. hard and as long as I have to to be successful. Yeah. You just needed someone to guide you how to get there. Yeah. So I, I tried a bunch of different jobs, gyms, front desk, sales, I mean, graveyard shifts. At Were you good stations. at sales? Because I would think you'd be good at sales. I loved it. And, and, my, <laughs> and my biggest thing was everyone in my, so I did gym sales. I did membership yeah. sales. Everyone in my gym was trained by the manager or themselves to be a go-getter. I was a go-giver. Oh, nice. Right? I love it. Yeah. I don't, you know, you come to my gym. I'm, I'm going to tell you straight up, listen, this is the packages we have. Do you believe that if you spent 30, 40 bucks a month, you could make an extra 100 at least from your job performing or from side tasks? Or would your dating life be better? And everyone would say yes. And I would say, here's the options. Just pick one. Yeah. And Or, or instead of like sitting That's my like, 120 rule, man. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, so $100 so, worth of value. So that's for 20 back. Yeah. So, so working at a gym and, and working with commission, it, that really opened my eyes as to like what being – successful man but the problem was it wasn't scalable i was using my 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 you know my hours sitting in a gym working for somebody else and it just, and it just wasn't scalable. right so that's when i when i that's when the idea of being an entrepreneur first got planted in my mind what does that mean being an entrepreneur does it mean working at a gym at a car dealership at a bank or does it mean planting a seed uh, an idea and turning it into a business and then scaling that by yourself potentially with a partner. So I was like, all right, so gyms aren't going to be it. Cars won't be it because it's not scalable. That's not my business. So then I started looking for a business I could own. First idea I had was Irvine Spectrum here. Yeah. I thought about my, my, my boy owned a iPhone repair uh, kiosk. Yeah. He went from one location to eight locations before he started doing drugs, lost all of it. But that opened my eyes as to how easy, potentially easy it is to start one of these kiosks and then scale into multiple actual stores. So I wanted to sell uh, jewelry. Those uh, cheap watches, rings, yeah. and bracelets you, you see at the malls, I wanted to sell those. Problem was you wanted an, you needed an initial 12K investment uh, to pay the Irvine company for their fees and get a kiosk, get inventory. inventory. My dad wasn't going to do it, and I had no money. Um, so I was just sitting, I remember I was sitting there yelling at my dad because my dad to this day delivers pizza. Wow. And, um, but he's got, he's got cash from his, from his life, life savings. He's got half a million in cash sitting in a bank. And he delivers pizza. <laughs> I'm like, Dad, why don't you keep doing your thing? Give me 12K. Let me start this business. And this could potentially be our family business. But my dad has always hated risks. 
My yeah. whole family has gone the college route. Very simple. You go to work in the morning, come home at five, knowing you have a paycheck at, at the end of the month. Everything is safe. So for, for me to be this guy who's taken 12K of, of their hard-earned money to start this business that could potentially just go to, go to, go to nothing, they weren't gonna they weren't gonna be a part of it, so that wasn't gonna be it either. Um, so after that, I, there was a bunch of other stuff that I had my eye on, but the problem was always the initial investment capital. Capital, yeah. Did it affect your relationship with your parents that your dad won't give you the money? There was none, man. There there was no relationship. Me and my oh, so. me and my dad, I, I could talk about this for hours. There, yeah. there was none. Um, gr- growing up, it was more like I had a bully living with me than, than instead of a dad. There was wow. no, there was I I, I can't. Did that name, help you? One thousand percent. Yeah, one thousand percent. I, you know, like I'm super soft dad, and I talk about like empowerment. I just was on with Joe Desenza with the, you know, Spartan races, and we talk about you know, that whole resistant and you know empowering our kids. He drops his kids off. He just kicked them out of his car four miles from the house just to tough them <laughs> you know, up. I'm like, oh my god, my wife would kill me, and I would cry. Like, yeah. but I, I had very similar way with no father growing up, and I just don't have the heart you know, to toughen my own kids up. I'm trying to figure out inspirational ways to toughen them up. But there's something to be said about that hardcore, you know, resentment chip on my shoulder that has made me successful. Do you credit kind of the negative side to for yeah. your success? Um, I, I would have been okay with really hard discipline if, if, if that was my dad, like yeah. being dropped off five miles into a desert. <laughs> You're okay. Yeah, it sucks. Yeah, Joe said that's cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it sucks. Yeah, I'd hate him for it. But when I'm 30, 40, I'd be like, you know what? My dad was hard. Yeah. And I'm okay with that. But for problem, a reason, for a good yeah. reason, positive reason. The problem with he, he wasn't he wasn't hard. He wasn't anything. He wasn't hard. He wasn't good. He was just just nothing. He would wow. just hit me. That's it. That's oh, all he, he would do. You. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, but the thing is, I, I walked away with two things. One, how not to be a dad. So when I'm a dad, I'm gonna be a kick-ass dad. Yeah. I'm gonna be a good dad. Two, you you know you put a, a, a little bucket and you you put a rat inside and you heat up the bucket. Where's the rat gonna go? It's not gonna stay in the bucket. So my my, my shitty life was the, was the bucket, and I was definitely not gonna stay in it because it was I was I was heating up. Yeah. You know my, my dad was a, was a flame, and you know I was a little rat, yeah. and uh, you know I was, it, it was it was it was I was it was not a place I wanted to be at. So when I when I know this is a life I don't want to don't want to have and don't want to be in. There's only one way to go, which is up. So every every minute of my, my my time with my family living at home, I only had one thing in my mind: How do I get out of here? What what steps do I got to take to be able to live on my own and just just have a normal life? I didn't even care about like Lamborghinis and Ferraris yeah, yeah. and fancy things. You wanted out. I just wanted to not fucking wake up and worry about like getting smacked for no yeah. reason. And you actually were homeless for a little while while you were yeah. trying to transition as well because that was better than being at home. Yeah, I mean, I didn't last. Yeah. I, I ended up just crawling back to my family because yeah. you, you know you're sitting uh, so i was in i lived in irvine just one year i had enough and i just packed my bags and i took a train to la i had 50 bucks on me a uh, train was like 15 or 20 or something so i mean i'm just i got to la i'm sitting in downtown by the train station it's midnight uh and i'm just like what the fuck did i just do <laughs> right <laughs> i love that i was terrified man yeah it's, it's a too. terrifying feeling um i had i, I don't know where i was gonna go i'm surrounded by all these crackheads <laughs> downtown yeah. and i'm just like fuck like what do i do called my cousin and she's like listen that's the this is the wrong way of doing things go back apologize start a business get a job save money and then try this again move out the right way that's what i did i went back what business did you start YouTube, man. So how did you decide? So YouTube is a business, right? And you're yeah. successful at it. You got these great companies like Bang right there. But I don't think people get it. You know, people say to me, oh, you're an influencer. I'm like, I'm not an influencer. I have influence, but that's not my job, right? You are a content provider. Mm-hmm. That's, that's different, right? I mean, you, you, you're a YouTuber, but YouTubers especially, in my opinion, you're a content provider. You're your own channel. You're your own content provider. You are NBC when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. And we just have this great system now that allows people that are creative, hungry, diligent, to create really good content that's more entertaining than a lot of shit that you see on TV. And that's when I see Who Man TV. You know, I sit there and go, this stuff is awesome. Mm-hmm. You know, and whether it plays on my computer or, you know, Shit, half the stuff on TV I watch on my phone anyway now, and I'm an old guy, right? Uh, but so, wh- you know, how did that transition of 
you took this seriously as a business. And I love yeah. in the context that you explained being an entrepreneur, having a business. Never once did you call yourself an influencer. Never once did you call yourself an entertainer. You're an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. How did you, because a lot of people don't get this part. How did you sit there and go, all right, I'm going to partner with my boy and you know I'm going to be a YouTuber. This yeah. is my business. Yeah. So remember I told you after um, not being able to, not having enough capital to start a business, I still have my eye open for the next uh, potential path I could yeah. take. Um, during high school, when I first moved here, I told you, when I finished high school, that's when I got used, to, I had just gotten used to high school. Because when I moved to America, I don't want to speak the language, I'm not used to the culture, I don't know how to make friends. So high school, my idea of fun was to go home from school, which I had to walk home because I couldn't even afford a bike. And I remember Tuesday, Wednesday, my two favorite YouTubers would post a video. Um, it was uh, Ownage Pranks and Simple Pickup. Um, <laughs> I know them both now, which is crazy. But I, w I was their fan, and and you know a after high school I picked up a couple more uh, YouTube YouTube um, creators as my as my as my to go places to watch stuff, and that was my way of having fun. And one day I come home and I and I see a video of one of them posting a video about his new car, new Jaguar, and I'm like, how does this guy? And I and I'd watched previous videos about him explaining his life story, and it was super super similar to mine, maybe even a little worse. <laughs> so seeing him. Um, get a new car, I was like, holy crap, how does this guy buy a new car? And I dug online, I dug a little deeper about like social media influencers and YouTubers owning cool things and traveling, and I was, I was trying to find out how do they make money. And I read about YouTube ads and Google ads and sponsorships and all these, all these things they were doing, and I, and I thought, so you were telling me my aunt here has gone to dental school for 12 years, and she works, she still works at 65 years old for 150K a year, while this guy here blew up a year ago off this viral prank video, and now he's sponsored, he's traveling the world, he just bought a Jaguar, he has a house, he's in movies, and more importantly, this guy has anyway, So now, I just you realize you can make a ton of money, yeah, and so actually have a business through Google Ads and, and creating content that is entertaining, Yeah, but there's a million great ideas out there, and I see a million great ideas, I see influencers on Musical.ly through YouTube and all of that. It's not as easy as it looks. No. You know, I got YouTube up my, backside because I'm a businessman first you know, I have a traditional business and they're like we want to make you a via you convert so well into subscribers in, you know you're the only middle-aged guy that you know people aren't you're just not showing them how to fix an outlet you know they're actually watching your videos and I'm like well don't really know exactly how the hell you make your money you know I've asked him Martin calling me going hey we'd like to give you a car for a year because we want you to have the car in the video I get that but how did you make this leap and say all right all right, I've learned you can make money, but how did you actually learn to make the money? There was no other way, man. I, I was, I, you know, I told myself I was going to try this for three months. If it didn't go anywhere, I would treat it the same way as college, as my gym job, and just move on through the next chapter. I, you didn't limit your point of entry. No, you should try I, it out. And but you have a partner too, don't you? I did have a partner at the beginning, which beginning. is a, a really funny story. He actually lives in Irvine. Uh, we we I remember it was a, it was a Friday. I was at his house and I was like, "Yo, I got this crazy idea. I want to start a channel and make prank videos." And he was like, and he was all, already a photographer, videographer. So he was like, "Oh, that's cool. Let's do it." And I was like, "Yeah, but just me. Like, it's gonna, it's gonna pay." I was I was hyping him up. I remember I was trying to sell him my idea of doing this as like, as, like a, as like a job. He was working at a print shop at the time while going to college full time while paying for his uh, brand new Mercedes that he had leased. So he had bills to pay. And nice. He, and he was paying bills at home too. Um, so we start, we're like five, six, seven videos in. It's been a couple of weeks. And obviously there's no money yet. There's no there's no views coming in. So he's he starts slacking a little bit. Three months in, he ends up quitting because he's like, yo, I got to pay my bills. I can't just be walking around with Best you. Best thing happened to you. you. Know, he's, he, we're both 21. His parents are, are, are on his ass. So he ends up quitting. Three weeks later, I get my first check from Google for 1350 um, and then and then he's like, oh, I'm on back in. I'm right. like, listen, bro, you, you said you're out. Yeah, good for you. Yeah, so I had a partner, but he, he didn't believe in it, man. I mean, it's the, Do you still talk to that guy today? Sometimes. Now that you're huge? Yeah, I mean, he understands. What, you know, what, I have, I have what a happened. friend who invented Pictionary, and he had three other friends. He kind of, they played after they worked at the bar. Yeah. And he told them, hey, I want to start this game as a business. It was Pictionary. And the other three guys were like, yeah, go ahead, dude. And then one guy's like, well, if you make it, buy me a boat. And so he said, sure. So, you know, he ended up selling for like $40 million mm. and then parlaying that into Starbucks and the Microsoft. He's a multimillionaire today. One of my best friends. But the guy with the boat, he ended up getting his boat. No way. <laughs> yeah. He should Years have, later, he should have the guy showed up at his door. Dude, you owe me a boat? And my buddy's like. Should have asked for a jet. Exactly. Should have asked at least a million, right? 
Why not take a lottery ticket, especially when a guy lives up to his words? All right, last question here. Um, I think YouTube is the most powerful of all channels. I, I really do. I think it's going to last the longest. Uh, it, it has the best format to create a channel to actually be a brand yourself. What's the best piece of advice? You're so good at it. What's the best piece of advice you would give to someone like me that has content that's playing and is paid for and on all these other formats but finds it more challenging to grow YouTube at the pace I can grow LinkedIn or Instagram or some of the other things going on. What's the best piece of advice that you can give me? It's always the same problem with every channel. I've done this so many times. I've seen people like Grant Cardone's channel, Ty Lopez's channel. Yeah. And what amazes me and blows my mind is how everybody for some reason thinks YouTube equals content. If you have good content, you're going to go viral, whatever right. that means. Yeah, right. People think viral is like this magical unicorn that's going to come to you at night and just do a little spill on your no, video. No, that's chlamydia. It's a different viral. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, if you look at my channel, I'm the only channel in the world to have 25 videos in a row all having over 20 million views. Yeah. So is that really, Easy. am I spending money on a lot of ads? Am I just super lucky? Or is there actually a formula you can follow to get a lot of views? If you look at YouTube as a platform, it's got an algorithm, just like Instagram, Snapchat, and Facebook. It's a lot better than Instagram, which is why Instagram's tags are useless. But on YouTube, about, in my opinion, about 35% is actual content. The rest is just other elements, like the most important one is uh, SEO. Because YouTube as a platform is a robot. It's not a human being that can watch your video and be like, oh wow, this is a better entrepreneur video over all these other ones, so I'm gonna put this one first. It's an algorithm, there's-, there's It's there's, like Amazon, get the box. There's, there's certain <laughs> things it looks at to, to decide which video is to place first and which video is to hide on page 30 that no one will ever, ever see, right? So let's say you have a really amazing video, you have the most, amazing 10 entrepreneurs yeah. in the world in one room as a, as a video you have. Algorithm doesn't care, doesn't know what it is. So you, you tell the algorithm what this video is via metadata, via the SEO, so the tags you use, the title, the description box, what keywords are being commented in the comment section, yeah. the, trans, the transcript of the actual video. When, he, when we're talking in a video right now, if you post this on YouTube, within 24 hours, there's an auto-generated transcript, subtitles, by the algorithm, with whether you want it or not, it's there. And if they do that, not only to provide um, sub uh, subtitles for, the, for to make the viewers, the viewers' experience smoother, but more importantly, to understand what the video actually is about. Because I can sit here and type um, the tags, title, and make it seem like this is an entrepreneur video. But if, if we're talking about fitness in the actual video, yeah. then the algorithm will hear a lot of fitness words, then it'll assume this video has something to do with fitness and it'll be appreciated by a fitness audience. YouTube is a business. It wants to make sure the viewer's experience are really good, so they'll keep watching more and more videos, click on more and more ads, make Google more money. So by understanding that, yeah, there's, there's, there's a right way to decide what kind of tags to put in the title, description box, tag box, and then what to tell, tell your fans as a CTA call to action to type what words in the comment section. Here's an idea. So my biggest uh, videos are my shampoo pranks. Biggest ones, 160 million views. Smallest ones, like 10 million views out of 13 parts, okay? Every single video, I, I make sure to end it with saying, guys, if you want to see more shampoo pranks, all you have to do is two things. Share it, easy. Two, comment down below do more shampoo pranks. The sharing part is hard because I'm asking people to take a step. Right. Give me your time, go on your phone, open Facebook, put the link and share it. It's, it's tough, not many people will actually do that, right? Yeah. But saying comment below, do more shampoo pranks, people love giving their opinion. They might say do more shampoo pranks in Japan, here, <laughs> yeah. add fake blood next time, do cold water, right? Yeah. So almost everybody does it. What happened, and, and it doesn't seem like I have an agenda behind asking for it. Sure. When I say share my video, I'm asking you for a favor to right. make me more famous, make me more money or whatever. People think that way, right? But when you're asking a comment. It's harmless. Yeah. But what happens is when people type in do more shampoo pranks, especially pranks, now the comment section has a lot of people saying pranks, 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 pranks. Smart. That will strengthen. People search for best pranks, right? Exactly. That will strengthen my placement and algorithm for the keyword pranks. Genius. So in, in this video, it, it would be something like, comment down below which other entrepreneur you want to see on my show next. So now people are going to spam all these other big entrepreneurs' names in the comment section. So the algorithm will see all these names and assume this video has something to do with Grant Cardone, Gary Vee, Ty right. Lopez. Dave Meltzer. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. All my boys, don't leave me out. <laughs> okay, that's awesome. Um, well, I think this last section, if you're not uh, listening right now or haven't, you gotta go back and re-listen. You gotta 
that was gold. This story is gold. You are an ultra entrepreneur. And I just love the fact that you really have your own vibration or frequency. You believe in yourself. You're not a quitter. And you've had plenty of challenges that everyone else, nothing's been given to you. And I only see greater success for you. So anything I can do for you, who man, just let me know because this was one of my favorite episodes. I think it may set the record for the longest episode. So it's uh, you, you did the job. Don't forget to drink your bang. Get as hyped up as who man and I. This is Dave Meltzer with who man Nuri here with entrepreneurs, the playbook.